Thank you, Grace, for this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about something I've been thinking about now for the last couple of years, I guess. Um, it has involved a lot of thought and sort of false starts. Uh, in fact, as you can see from, from the title, so the, there's a couple of quotation marks that have sneakily made their way in around the word Gothic um, since, the, since the first time I sent Grace this title. And that's because over the last couple of months, really, I've had some sort of additional insight into this project, and, and there's a point that I need to make about uh, the description Gothic, but we'll get to that in a while. So, um, yes, as Grace said, my name is Tom Kushkiri, uh, I'm from GDI, and this project is as much about the topic itself as it is about myself sort of um, figuring out what my role is as an illustrator academic and sort of what that mean, what it means to carry out research into this field. Um, so there's going to be a few questions that I'm kind of posing myself, um, but hopefully this will be a sort of interesting talk for all of you. It also sort of traces back a little bit to my MA work, and I'll have a bit of an opportunity to talk to you about that as well, because I realize I've never given a public talk about my, my MA stuff. So, okay, but in essence, over the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about to you about um, two artists and writers. So the crucial thing is that they are both artists, illustrators, as well as being writers. So there's Mervyn Peake, the uh, English novelist, artist, illustrator. Um, and the second artist is the American illustrator and writer Edward Gorey, pictured here with his beloved cats. And as a sort of guiding description of what this project is, I guess this is as broad and as good a way to sum it up as possible. So it's essentially a practice-based literary and visual comparative study of these two artists. Um, the practice base is in brackets. There's an aspect there in which this project is uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is very much the sort of initial research stage of things, but that is the ultimate aim. Um, however, this description doesn't quite capture sort of the essence of the project. And if you'll allow me, I need to go back a little bit to where the project started. And I'll sort of talk to you a bit about where it came from, and it's, it's going to feel a little bit like a divergent, but I'm sure you will we'll come back in due course. So the start of this project um, deals a lot with the notion of pastiche and, and sort of my thoughts about it and how it relates to my own work. So um, if you can cast your mind back to 2012, this is sort of where the project, project has its origins. I just started my MA in Brighton um, doing sequential design and illustration. And at the time, I was uh, reading this collection of short stories by Georges-Louis Borges. And I was particularly taken by one story um, in this collection, and it's called Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. And it's, it's a great little short story. It's a kind of a amusing little tale written from the point of view of a, of a literary critic. And in essence, what it does is it tells the story of a 20th century French uh, academic, a polymath, who, um, for reasons unknown, embarks on this project to, in essence, recreate um, Cervantes' Don Quixote from scratch. So the notion of what this means is sort of um, left uh, intentionally ambiguous. But the point is not, he's not, trying to, he's not trying to read it, learn it by heart, and then write it down. His aim is initially to sort of inhabit Cervantes, a 17th century um, author, in, in the fullest possible sense, and then come to the Don Quixote sort of anew and, and produce it himself out of nowhere, kind of, so to speak. Um, and Borges, in his role as the critic in this, in this short story, tells us that Menard achieves this in the end, and he manages some extracts, he manages to sort of recreate a few paragraphs here and there. So, you know, obviously, it doesn't quite add up, and, and Borges is having fun here. He's sort of, he's, he's kind of making serious points, but it is a rather sort of wry and tongue-in-cheek um, look at notions of authorship and appropriation. And we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. But at the time, I was thinking a lot about this business of appropriating voices and identities and things like that. And the reason I was thinking about this is because I was working with uh, the illustrator designer, George Hardy. So he was my tutor at Brighton. And he's, his work often conjures up questions of uh, sort of artistic appropriation and identity and voice and things like that. Um, he, he works a lot in, in that field where he sort of takes components as and when he needs them and sort of combines them into 
new and exciting things. So he would often talk to me about this notion of a pastiche with no original. And um, for George, this meant often the creation of sort of physical artifacts, often printed ephemera, that weren't a direct copy of something else, but in the hands of the viewer, the audience, sort of they basically, they captured the essence of that thing, and in their mind it was a copy of something else. But there wasn't one direct thing that you could associate it. Um, George uses this a lot in his own work. So, so here's a little example. So it's um, an imagined cover, cover for a Tantan um, collection of stories. And each of these sort of little components, George would go to great lengths to make them himself. So they kind of look, you know, all the individual pieces have their origin in something that we very quickly can understand and associate. So you've got the sort of scientific study of the seashells over there. You've got the map at the back. You've got the um, drawing of what looks like a kind of scarab beetle done in pen and ink. So they're all kind of very specific voices that have been taken and appropriated for this piece of work. So I've kind of labeled it pastiche with a purpose. Um, and the crucial thing, so, so the first stage is that all these things come together. You look at it and you think, oh yeah, you know, that looks like that piece and that looks like that. And, and George takes great pride in making them look just right. So he once gave this talk about his career where it was all about these sort of found objects. And at the end of the talk, after an hour of presenting these things, he revealed that these were all actually his things. He'd made them. So there's, there is that important aspect that he sort of, they look right, and they, they, they definitely have that voice of, of something else. So there's the association. But up till now, that's, what is that? That's a sort of, it's a fun, interesting exercise in style, I guess. You know, it's a kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of um, sort of focus on, on technique and understanding and then recreation and, and aspects like that. But the crucial thing in, in Hardy's work is that it doesn't stop there. There's something else. So when you turn the image around, um, Tantan pops out, right? So he's there. There's his mouth, his eyes, and that's his quiff. So, so this was kind of very important to me. It's this thing of um, having the starting point where there's um, questions of pastiche and appropriation, but it doesn't stop there. You do, you do the hard work, you get it all right, and then you put it together in a format that then gives you something else. So there's that next stage. To, to sort of make a point on this, um, another of George's pieces, which up until now I haven't managed to source an image for, but I'm going to describe it for you. Um, I've pestered him a little bit for an image that hasn't, hasn't been forthcoming so far, but hopefully later on I'll be able to show you this. So there's, there's a piece of his called Hergé Discovers Tantan. And what it is, is it's the back of an envelope, and there are fountain pen drawings on it. And they're all sort of ostensibly by Hergé, but they're not. They're by George Hardy. He's doing the drawings. So the point is, all of them, there's all these little sort of profiles of characters, and all of them are almost but not quite Tantan. So it's basically sort of where we're in the moment where Hergé is kind of working him out. Kind of figuring out his nose, his profile, all these things. There's a few of them like that. Very importantly, the Tantan that we recognize and we know is Hergé's is not there. So there's a gap in the middle. It's sort of marked out with marker pen, and then it's been cut out. And this, this moment, the missing Tantan, so this is something I'm going to keep talking about sort of as I talk about my own work, is, is crucial. So that's where the shift happens. If Tantan was there, it would just still be a sort of exercise in style. So here's one, and here's a few others that have changed. But the fact that it's not there then takes us into this world of, oh, OK, we're sort of there in the moment where Hergé is doodling on the back of, a, of an envelope in sort of this exciting moment where he finds the character, and he chops him out, and he takes him elsewhere because that's important, and I don't know, sticks him on his wall or whatever. So there's that game then. There's a sort of visual, little, clever little visual game happening. And, and this is sort of what... what for me, differentiates a sort of exercise in style from something that can only be described as a piece of work by, in this case, George Hunt. At the time, I was thinking a lot about voices and appropriation and things like that. So I was, um, I was doing my own MA, which was completely unrelated. It was a, it was a study of Maltese Catholicism and censorship and things like that. And, and what I did on the project was so I created, I created this sort of um, 
religious tome that listed um, banned books and, and was sort of typeset in this very, very tiny, um, closely set list of, of titles that you're not meant to read. And each one of these was a fictitious book that, um, that related somehow to an aspect of Maltese Catholicism that I sort of wanted to critique and, uh, and analyze. And what I did was I sort of assumed the voice of uh, some kind of religious censor making this list of stuff that you're not meant to read. Um, I printed it out, bound this thing, tried to make it look, you know, this idea of a pastiche with no original, it looks like somehow sort of religious Bible important tone, but it's not quite a copy of something in particular. And then I went in and I started making these things as well. So there were sort of um, blasphemous comics from the 80s and cartoons, and which, which meant, weren't meant to be published, and I made some picture books as well. And each time, you know, I would delve into this sort of field, I would sort of take what I needed and try and sort of incorporate it into something that looked the part. Um, but crucially, this wasn't, this, this wasn't the main point of the project. The project then developed into the voices around it. So I then had a sort of collector who was putting all these pieces together, and that's where the core of the project was. So it wasn't the fact that this looks like a, an American floppy or it looked like a cartoon or from a certain era, etc. There was an extra story to it. So that was, for me, my moment of sort of missing tantrums, so that extra step. But I was thinking a lot about this sort of pastiche and voices and things like that. So going back to Borges a little bit, within this weird story that I told you about, um, Borges says to us, it's a revelation to compare the Don Quixote of Cervantes with Menard. And so remember that Menard's Cervantes is just extracts. And they are the same as the original. So Borges is saying, oh, it's very, it's very exciting to compare them. And he invites us to compare two particular paragraphs. And I've written them here so that you can check they are exactly the same. So in Cervantes, we have that paragraph. And then we're told by Borges, um, here's Menard's, which is identical, but infinitely richer. Right? So these two things, they are word for word the same. They are the same words in the same sequence with the same punctuation. But Borges says, oh, yes, yes, the Menard one is infinitely richer. And then he goes on to wax lyrical about why it's infinitely richer. And obviously, he's, he's having fun, right? There's a bit of sort of, he's poking fun at certain sort of academic traditions. But he is saying something serious in there. And it relates, in some sense, to reception theory. So Hans Robert Jauss's Horizon of Expectations, which is what we as readers take to a piece of text. Um, I'm not going to pretend to understand this. Uh, my wife is a receptionist, and she's promised to explain this to me properly, so I won't go into it. But there is this crucial thing that basically the way in which a text is understood, and as Borges is saying, the moment when a text is written, these are, you know, the, the time in which this is carried out and the cultural and social context in which this happens is important, and it can't be overlooked. So Jaus's work was crucial in sort of taking us away from this idea that a text has absolute meaning, and rather there's this notion of reception theory that basically the reader brings meaning with them. Alongside this, I was thinking about when we go from written word to the drawn line, is there something interesting that can be said about there being a copy which is infinitely richer or infinitely poorer? When we walk away from sort of typeset words in the same order, but go to a piece of artwork that is somehow sort of the same, but not quite the same. There's nuance in there that can give us a bit of leeway. There's also questions involving collage that conjure up sort of interesting questions here. So this is, up till here, this was the sort of model of thought that I had going on up to this point. So fast forward to um, two years ago now, when I started here, um, and I was having a conversation with Kevin, who at the time was leading level four. And we'd done, a, we'd done a nice breaking session on the very, very first day with a classroom of um, level fours. And we were paired up, and we were meant to tell each other the last film or book that we'd read. And I was very nervous, so I made sure I paired myself up with Kevin <laughs> rather than any of the scary students. And we were talking about books, and we agreed. We said, oh, you know, I've been thinking about reading this. He said, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll read it as well. So we started reading Titus Grown, which is a book by Mervyn Peake, um, set within the castle of Gormenga. I'll be telling you what it's about in a bit. But we started reading it, 
together and after a couple of weeks we kind of checked in see how we were getting on and without thinking too much about it I said yeah I'm enjoying it for some reason I keep seeing scenes as little vignettes by Edward Gawley in particular uh, the West Wing which is something I'd read recently it's a silent book of his and it's mostly just kind of moody images of corners of rooms and walls and things like that. I kept having these images sort of pop into my mind. And, and I said this to Kevin, and he, he knew Gory as well, and we, he kind of got excited about it. He's like, okay, oh, that would be exciting, you know, visualizing it in sort of Gory's language. And then we sat down and we thought, oh, we were wondering what would the Gory drone look like, so we sort of doodled some things. And, okay, it sounded like a fun little exercise, but sort of some alarm bells were going off in my mind, and it's sort of a valid endeavor. So Gory is, is copying a lot. He's, he's quite popular um, on Deviant Art, for example, if you ever head there. Um, both visually and literally, uh, and in terms of literary tone, he's, he's, he's copied quite a lot from, from things such as this, which is a sort of rather superficial adaptation of aspects of Gori. Um, so this is the, so the Gashlikon Tinies, which we were talking about, Frank, which is where um, various children and gruesome deaths and in alphabetical order. And um, this is taken and applied to, to the Doctor Who universe. So these are all the various Doctor Who characters that we know of. So here we've sort of got a, you know, a sur surface copy, which is, you know, it's fun, it's entertaining, but in terms of sort of getting down to the actual look of Gori, with the exception of it being line drawing and in black and white, there's, it isn't quite there. So we've got stuff which is, you know, greater care has been taken in getting getting that right. So this is uh, the Perry Bible Fellowship comics, Nicholas Gurewich. Um And here we can see that sort of the tone has been caught a lot more carefully. Um, the images are right, you know, it, it, it's, it's there. And the, the mood and sort of humor of, of the rhyme is also, is also pretty strongly Gory-esque. But these weren't sort of reassuring me, they were sort of worrying me is, is this project, you know, is there something in there? I felt there was some sort of something exciting that could perhaps be examined, but is there an artistically sound and or, so academically sound and or artistically engaging project in here? So I, I found myself thinking again about all the sort of pastiche work of my, of my MA in relation to, to this idea of taking an existing work and sort of trying to throw someone else's visual language and basically, clarity started to happen when, when I realized that basically there were two projects. There. And this can be nicely encapsulated in a change in, in articles. So the Gory Grown would be a Hardy-esque exercise in sort of self-conscious appropriation of Gory's language, possibly applied to Titus Grown. My hand in there would possibly need to be slightly invisible. Um, you know, I wouldn't put my name anywhere to be this kind of little game played with, with these two characters. Um, this would need the missing Tantan moment. Okay, so you don't, you don't just take Titus Grown and draw it in the sound of Gory. That's an exercise. You need that extra step. This can be compared to a Gory Grown, where there is no suggestion of trying to sort of hoodwink the audience and pretend that this is kind of um, Gory's work, but rather it's kind of a study of the two and seeing if there are connections, links between the two, and see if there's insight into these two characters that can emerge from such a study. So the latter is what I've embarked upon so far, and it's been good, it's been helpful, it's been interesting. My hope is that that's now going to feed into the definite article version of this project. So this is what I've been doing. So a Gory Grown, reading Mervyn Peake's Titus Grown with the help of Edward Gory. So, it's Joust again, and what it is, is acknowledging that my initial sort of unfiltered approach to Titus Grown conjured up Gori, and it's making that the subject of inquiry. So filling my head artificially, intentionally, sort of to the brim with, with Gori in, in every possible aspect, and then taking that to my reading of Titus Grown and seeing what happens when I read it as an illustrator. So seeking out um, which sections to, to depict, the moments, the instances, etc., etc. Okay, so my, my first, when I, when I realized this, I said, okay, I'm, do, I'm doing the, the A version. 
I went through sort of seek connections and contrast between the two. Is there something that justifies linking Edward Gorey with um, Mervyn Peake other than the fact that their books were at some point in my bedside table? So there are interesting links. Most potent of these probably that they both have a kind of um, ancestor in Edward Lear. So both um, Edward Gorey and Mervyn Peake were big fans of nonsense prose, nonsense poetry. Uh, Gorey himself illustrated Lear uh, a few times. This is his illustration for the dong with the luminous nose. Peake himself published several volumes of nonsense poetry, uh, both as standalone pieces, and they also make an appearance in the Titus books as little bits of found uh, poetry in there. Peake himself was an illustrator, an artist, and he created what the publishers have since called illustrations for Titus Grove. And this was interesting for me because sort of reflecting about the process of illustration, what it means to be an illustrator, etc. As far as I'm concerned, the drawings that Peake did whilst he was writing Titus Grove were very much drawings that he was doing as a writer trying to figure out the characters. And these are very different to illustrations that you would do to accompany a book. So we can see them here. These are various... Um, drawings, doodles, um, so the one on the left was done a little bit later, but there's a little equivalent drawing of it in his, in his sketchbook. And they were, done, they were done just there, you know, often overlapping the writing itself. And you can see that it's someone grappling with the character, trying to work it out. So they're not, they're not really book illustrations in the, in the classical sense, and in fact, Peake had always hoped that he would rework them into proper illustrations for later editions, but... Um, uh, this never happened. The publisher ran, they didn't put them in in the first edition and they ran these in later editions. So there, there are six of them and they're sort of scattered through the book. And as far as I'm concerned, they don't, they don't bring much to the reading of, of Titus Grove. If anything, they, they slightly undermine the possibility of you sort of conjuring up your own images of these characters. It's a different story if we look to Peake's cover design, where he was very consciously, you know, assuming the role of a classical sort of book cover designer. Um, and that's the drawing he did for that. And I think it's interesting in terms of what, sort of what I'm thinking about, you know, um, Corey's line work. There's, there, are, there are echoes here. Um, so so this, is, this is Peake doing a cover, as opposed to Peake as writer figuring out the artist, figuring out the character. Both of them provided illustrations for Peak Bleak House. And again, there's a nice little comparison that can happen here. Peak himself very much concerned with capturing the essence of um, the characters. Uh, I think we've got this flight on the right over there. Um, these can be contrasted rather dramatically with, with Gory's illustrations for Bleak House, where the character is almost, almost anonymous. We don't really care about the physical features of them, but it's more about placing them somewhere and capturing the essence and the sort of the mood at that point in time. And then we come on to the notion of Gothic. So, so this was starting to become important to me. The realization went on that both the Gormenghast trilogy by Peake and Gory himself often get um, labels as being Gothic. And I think the interesting thing, the thing that connects them is that they're both incorrectly labeled as Gothic, essentially. So Gormenghast itself takes place within Gormenghast Castle, which, to all intents and purposes, is pretty much your archetypal Gothic castle, kind of where it provides the setting, it provides the right, the right environment for the story to take place, but the narrative itself is very much in a sort of romance vein, and it is, it's often considered nowadays to be the first of a so-called fantasy of manners. So it's a version of a sort of comedy of manners where there's a look at a certain particular social class, but in a fantasy setting. Gory himself, again, often described as Gothic, and sure, he did, um, he did sort of title sequences for, for sort of Gothic mystery-based TV show. He also provided illustrations and set designs for Dracula, so, you know, it's, it's justified. But there's a heck of a lot more whimsy and sort of... Um, absurdity to Gory's work than is kind of encapsulated under the label Gothic. On a related note, um, I was rather excited to find this description, which in my mind works and applies wholesale to both the Gormenghast works and to Gory's works themselves. So 
so surrealistic and macabre, amusing and somber, nostalgic and claustrophobic, poetic and poisoned. And, and it works beautifully if you're familiar with, with the book by Peake and with Gorey's work. It kind of fits, fits very, very, very squarely in both. So this was actually the first critic to sort of take Gorey seriously. So, so it was Edmund Wilson speaking about Gorey. But um, I've been playing this game where I take that quote and I give it to people who know both and I'm saying, yes, who's it for? And, and there is this sort of, as far as I know, um, as far as I can see, the sort of agreement that it does work for, for the Gorman death story. And finally, as a link, I was kind of excited to find out that Gori, who was, he, so he read extensively, and there's a lovely collection of um, correspondence between him and Peter Nomeyer. And amongst the books that they discuss, there is Titus Grown. So I was kind of excited, and I bought the book, and I, and I, and I kind of flicked through, I found the reference, found the page. And it's, it's tiny, <laughs> as it always is, it's kind of rather rather fleeting reference, but interesting nonetheless. So he, this, was, this was in January 69, so just after Mervyn Peake died, so Gory was obviously moved to sort of go back and, and remember Titus Grown, and he, and he says to Peter Nomai, he says, have you, have you read the Gorman Gath books? I read Titus Grown when it came out, and we've got this rather sort of vague little comment where he says, I got the impression that the whole thing was taking place underwater from the style. Now, it seems like a bit of a kind of opaque vague observation, but I was excited about this, and I'll come back to one specific image where I'll, I'll remind you of this, because it kind of chimed with the way I was seeing these images. Um, okay, so that was, that was me establishing that there are interesting connections between the two, and that it is quite an exciting exercise to carry out, sort of a sort of parallel analysis of two, two illustrators. In so then I went to studying Gori in sort of preparation for producing the military. And I tried to take a Menardian approach. So the, uh, Menard's first approach, which ultimately fails, is he tries to inhabit Cervantes. So he learns a language, and he tries to live like him, he tries to look like him. So, so I figured maybe I'd do that with Gory. And he liked the X-Files and Buffy and cats. And so I, I, I like all of these things. I watched lots of X-Files and Buffy and surrounded myself with cats, but that didn't help. So I did the next best thing for an illustrator, and I went to the formal aspects, and I started sort of studying the the various um, details of how Gory went about creating these works. So he used a particular type of dip pen called the tit quill, which gave this sort of fine, scratchy line, very little line width variation. He would draw at the size of reproduction, which was a sort of interesting observation for me. And in this day and age, it can be sort of overlooked, because nowadays we see everything on the screen, and the sense of what the size was is, is slightly lost, but this idea of drawing at that size, especially when you're doing pen work, I think is interesting because the, ten, the, the tendency is to draw larger and then you scale it down and that sort of tightens all the line work up. So this was interesting. Uh, he would do minimal preparation, preparatory drawings. Um, there are some unfinished works of his where you can see the pencil drawing underneath and there's not much. It's a basic outline of a person. So really his works take shape when the pen comes in. And interestingly, in a lot of interviews, he mentions the fact that he can't start working before he's written it first. And this is interesting, because to me, it speaks to this notion of what it means to be an artist slash illustrator, and the sort of illustrator element comes in even when it's your own work. You sort of need a piece of body of work to respond to. Okay, so all very well. This was kind of a nice little formal procrastination, I guess, so to speak. I then went, and this is sort of where it started to become interesting. And I, went to the works themselves, and I started studying them in some, some depth. <coughs> so what are the characteristics that sort of define Gory as far as I'm concerned? Well, his hatching approach is something that gets mentioned a lot. And for me, the interesting thing about this is that the, the manner in which he hatches his, his work is almost, almost to obfuscate rather than to clarify. So he achieves this impression of what I've call a sort of oppressive gray that permeates a lot of his work. And in addition, you get this sort of effect of what to me really kind of encapsulates this notion of sort of a moment captured in time, almost like static on your TV, where you've got a still image, but there's still a sense of sort of motion going on. So in a scene like this, this is taken from uh, the West Wing, where, where we've got, just got a little, little corner sort of slightly looks like that. I think you can really feel that's this idea of kind of um, oppressiveness of the hatching and this thing of there being a moment sort of captured over there. 
in terms of sort of compulsive hatching, it's interesting to compare um, this approach to another illustrator. So John Vernon Lord, um, he, so here's an illustration for, for the same scene that I showed you from Edward Lear earlier. So this is again the, uh, the dong with the luminous nose. And, and although we have, again, very sort of compulsive, obsessive um, hatching going on, there's a very different purpose to the hatching here. There's clarity is achieved in the different tones and the sort of geometric approach to these, to these lines. So that was my first observation. Next interesting one is what Gori doesn't show. So a lot of characters in Gori's work meet, um, or are about to meet, um, violent deaths. Um, and he often positions them, positions them where you just see their feet off on the left. And you have a group of people, often at the same incline, looking down at these feet on the left. And this was a nice little sort of revelation to me. It's that, okay, so here you've got three scenes where ostensibly the focus is the person who's just either died here, brained by a piece of, um, piece of a statue, or tied to train tracks, or met their death in, in, the, in the child's playroom. But the point is that they're not shown, right? So we see a little hint of them off on the left, and we see them again. So When we go to what is shown, something exciting about Gori's works is the distance between what's said and what is shown. So if we go to this example, we're told that little Augustus woke up to find his stuffed toy missing, and he's, he's over there on the left. He's rummaging on the bed looking for it. But he's off on the left, right? And our scene is given to us like this, and, and what we do is we, we go straight out of the room where Augustus is. We don't care about Augustus. We go into the corridor, we go to the painting on the wall in the corridor where there's this ethereal figure walking from left to right and we're left wondering what's that painting, what's going on inside. Right, so the, so the text is telling us, oh yes, yeah, so this is all about Augustus waking up and poor chap, he can't find his stuffed frisbee. But the image is saying, oh, forget about Augustus, let's, let's go out of this room, let's look at this weird painting on the wall. And I think that's kind of exciting. And, and Gori speaks about this a lot when he talks about the problem he would face when he would be regularly asked to illustrate horror stories, because you know um, Gori is, is gothic, so he should illustrate your horror story. And he would, he said the the two that he completed by the end of it, he was exhausted just by the effort of trying to find the other thing to illustrate. Right. So he speaks about, for example, the Telltale Heart. So Edgar Allan Poe. You, obviously, you can't you can't draw the Telltale Heart under the floorboards. That, that's giving the game away. So what do you draw? And he'd find this kind of rather excruciating and, and exhausting. But I think it's interesting, this thing of not drawing what's said. Finally, I found his approach to sort of encapsulating a lot in a little. So this idea of a whole story and a sentence is, for me, quintessentially Gori-esque. So in, for example, in this scene, so the blue aspic, in this particular instance, this is an image taken from actually a full story. There's, there is more to it. But just that, as it, as it is, with the image and the caption Jasper's records got broken as he was escaping from the asylum, is, I find it, it's glorious in, in, in the fact that it sort of gives you so much through so little. And you can almost imagine the entire world around it in the story. This image I don't know, but as far as I'm concerned, if we're talking about feeling like it's underwater, I think this kind of does a pretty good job of it in terms of that, again, that oppressive gray coming in, sort of suffocating and obscuring the, what's actually going on. OK, so that, that was kind of the, the bulk of my reflective part of this project. So where to next? So I started thinking about, OK, what's What's the next step? And the crucial thing for me was to go from the A part, which is really what I've done so far, to a the, the gory drum. So where does that come from? So what I did was I, I was now literally, so this was several weeks worth of really kind of delving in and copying gory and doing my own little sketches and things like that. And kind of studying scene after scene after scene in some, some detail. So what I did was I went back to 
um, the title's grown, and reread it. And and interesting things happen. So, so the passages that now jumped out to me were not the ones that I would have gone to earlier. They were ones that had potential for one or several of the aspects that I mentioned before. So this idea of encapsulating a, a story in a sentence or that it gives potential for drawing something else and accompanying it with those texts. So there was this really interesting moment where I could feel myself reading it possibly in the manner that sort of Edward Gorey would read it and highlighting things that I wouldn't normally highlight. And, and it, was, it was quite interesting. So I gave this talk last week in, in France and there was... I was initially horrified to find out there was a, a, a peak scholar in the room, um, but, but she was very nice and she said, she said she thinks this is interesting because she doesn't think that those are the things that Peake would have chosen himself to illustrate, and just the fact that sort of one of them is highlighted sheds new light on that scene, in particular uh, this last one, which I'll, I'll get back to in a second. So it still wasn't clear to me what, and it, I'll be honest, it still isn't quite clear to me what the missing tam tam moment is in all of this. But I'm kind of getting there, and conversations with, with other practitioners have helped, so feel free to tell me what I should do next. But what I have started doing is, I said, okay, I've, I've spent a lot of time drawing and analyzing, and it still remained in the world of sort of pastiche without a purpose. So I've stepped back, and I've, done, I've gone just to the imagery and just to the text, and I've started sort of smashing them together initially rather clumsily, but hopefully this is going to get better. So I've started finding Steerpike. So Steerpike is, is the villain in Titus Grown. Um, that's an illustration of Gori's. It's got nothing to do with Titus Grown, but I took him. I removed the, the girl that's about to meet an unfortunate death in, in Gori's version and, and you know, slapped it alongside the description of, of Steerpike, which I think we've got I showed you if I go back a second. We've got peaks. So peaks is steer pike is there on the right. Um, this is, well, as far as I'm concerned, this is the gory steer pike. And it is the gory steer pike. He drew this image. So that was a starting point. It was like, okay, I found a character that kind of reminds me, reminds me of Steer Pike. Then, then I did a little bit of collaging, so I took a cover of the poisoned lozenge, I think, by Gori, and that's the uh, the rest of it is is the start of his um, Gashley Crumpines, and that for me is um, Lord Sepulgrave. So he's the he's the Lord of of Gorm and Gas at the start of Titus Grown, and our first description of him is he walks in kind of. Or, early description of him. He walks in, he sits down at this table, he's very morose, he's constantly sort of very morose and drooping, and he sits at this long table, and we're told, as he sat this morning, he's high back chair, he saw before, and it's no light. And then I took a scene from The West Wing, which I realize now is really the, the image that I was thinking about a lot. And this was the, this was the section that the Peep scholar commented on, this idea so the air moved off to the left down a narrow art artery of Midnight Stones uh, and was immediately lost. So this is the moment where Lord Grown kind of disappears. And it's a very interesting moment because it's a tiny, it, it, it's momentous because he's walking off, he disappears. But it also happens in the midst of a sort of rather dramatic battle that's going on with, uh, between two other characters. And, and the idea of sort of focusing on that instant rather than everything else that was going on wouldn't have occurred to me, I think, if I didn't have a head full of gory at the time. And yeah, so I took, took the phrase from Titus Grown, slapped it onto an image by Gory. And, and it kind of works. The, the right tone is there, the right suggestion, you know, this idea that we're not shown Lords of our grave at all. Um, this idea of, a, of a, a story in a sentence is there as well. So this is sort of where I'm at. So where next? And to slightly preempt Stephen, what possible output for this work? So in a conversation after the conference last week, I was having with someone, it occurred to me that maybe Pete and Gory are 
I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but possibly they're red herrings. And actually, the interesting thing in this project is this process of taking two and smashing them together in an intelligent way. So I've, I've only just had that thought, and I'm it's slightly, it fills me with excitement and dread, <laughs> this idea that possibly the, the specifics of these two characters is not the whole point at all. But I think there's something in there. So what do I want to do with this work? Well, I'm, I'm writing up the first part for, for a, a journal, a journal of illustration. I've had conversations with the editors and they sort of give me some suggestions on how to turn it into something substantial. If I can figure out what the missing Fantan is, it could be an interesting exhibition in there, looking at this idea of sort of taking two voices and merging them together. Um, one of the questions at, at the conference was, well, well, what would you do if you worked with, with collage? You know, aren't there issues of copyright? And of course there are. This is an, art, you know, this is an academic exercise, but in the, presented in the right context, it can, I think, be interesting. That's why I've labeled it academic slash. The artistic output is, is rather obvious. So I've now started doing my own work, and this is getting somewhere. And it's kind of like a process of where all this entire this entire work was kind of informing my own approach to the book. And it would be exciting to maybe lead to an illustrated version. So the most recent illustrated version of this was by the Folio Society and Peter Harding's drawings from 1992. So I think there's, there's room in the market for a new illustrated Titus Grow, and then that would be exciting. It wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't look like gory, but it would be informed by this. And I think I'll stop there. And um, that's my Twitter if you want to have an argument with me. Or <laughs>